welcome to Le Grand Bouffe, the big feast, with myself, Cole Smithy, and my co-host, Mike Lacey. Good evening, Mike. Hey, what's going on, Cole? I'm looking forward to this podcast about the decline of Western civilization. I've been thinking about it, <clears throat> and also looking forward to drinking this fine dead guy ale rogue that you have brought along for us to imbibe. Tell us about this beer, Mike. Uh, I bought it at the Whole Foods. And Which I, one? Uh, the Union Square. Okay. And uh, Was it crowded? Of course, yeah. How long were you on the line? Oh my god, I was in the three items or less line, uh-huh. along with a lady with an entire cart, who I was very glad to see was turned away. Good. Shout out to whoever's working the three, I- three item line for enforcing the rules. Nice. I love it. Uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, we always want to pick one that kind of goes with the theme, and I thought a rogue dead guy ale was appropriate, because there's a, a bunch of people in this movie, but uh, some more famously than others, who are uh, some dead guys, and, but they're all rogues, that's for sure. Yeah, and, and of course, famously, Darby Crash, who Darby we're, we're, we're going to be talking about a little bit. Yeah, so I brought the beer, um, uh... We can we can taste it. We can talk about it. Yeah, that's gonna probably be my besides just scattered observations. I don't know crap about punk rock. Oh, well so, then you learned something. So I did. I learned a bunch. Um, and I'm but I'm I, I know that you're a connoisseur. So I'm looking forward to hearing uh, a bit of like the the history and like who these people are and um, you know the kind of question I have and then we'll get to the beer in a second. But like, how many of these people? Are kind of just in this movie, and how many are? No, they're a huge deal, you know. Right? Like, yeah, I don't know. But uh, right. anyway, let's let's try this beer. Yeah, let's taste this 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 good looking beer. Hmm. Lovely. Yeah, it's smooth, kind of sweet, light. Mm-hmm. It's um, you know, it's not it's not bitter. Definitely not any kind of the. I'm only surprised when I, we're not drinking an IPA here. Well, we're just going to talk about uh, Rogue a little bit. It says on, on the beer, handcrafted micro piece by Rogue Ales in Newport, Oregon, USA. Deep honey in color, that's for sure, with a malty aroma, rich, mm-hmm. hearty flavor, and a well-balanced finish. Do you think, like, I, I here's what I say. I don't know if we're getting better at describing beers. We've been doing this for about 30 weeks now. I I just kind of like thumb up, thumb down. I don't da- down, thumb down that many. Maybe we should look up like uh, fancy beer. fancy beer terms. Beer terms. Talk about mouthfeel. Well, you know, it's, fun, it's funny because my, my wife is a certified Cicerone. What? Let's, let's get her on here. I know. We should get her on here. That's a great idea. Yeah. just it, She should she should do because, one where she teaches us how to do this. Right. Well, that's a good idea. Yeah, that's a great idea. 30 but, episodes well, deep. Right? Because I, I, rem, I remember when she was taking the course... And that's exactly what they have to do in the class. You know, they have to identify all these flavors, and if there's any off flavors, it's really a hard, a hard thing to do. A lot of people fail the Cicerone test, and and it goes on. The, like you have to like, like three hour classes once a week for two months or something. It's heavy duty. And Cicerone is uh, like a sommelier like a, like, for it's a beer. Like a, that's exactly right. Mm-hmm. It's pretty pretty much a sommelier for for beer. I think that when she got her. Uh, certification. I think there were about five hundred in the country. Mm. So now there's probably a few more. And I bet there's a bunch now because because I, I don't know when she got it, but the the, the microbrewery explosion is kind of the past five but years. But a lot of people fail the test. That's that's cool. To, that's cool to hear. They're like, hey, yeah, fuck yourself, guys. Yeah, you and she, you and, 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 yeah, and she when she was going through it, she, you know, I think her. Her attitude was, you know, if I don't pass, I'm not going to take it again because it was so grueling. Wow. And she was having to get up at like five in the morning in February, in snowy, cold, bitter February to to go out. To Sounds the, worse than like the, the MCATs, because uh, they were somewhere out in Brooklyn or somewhere far deep Brooklyn, not just in Brooklyn. You know, I think people don't really understand about they don't about how vast and wide Brooklyn is. Get your ass on the F train and just oh my keep god, going get on the F, get on the Q. Going, There's so many different trains that go to Brooklyn because it's. That's how it is. There's it's spread out. Trains go east, they go west, they go. You ever take the Brooklyn shuttle? I tried not to go to Brooklyn lately. I've been going. That's a lot. how you know you fucked up when you're taking the Brooklyn shuttle. Is that a? That's not a subway, is it? Yeah, it's the S line. Oh no! How can you get on that? 
Just like you're drunk at night and you accidentally do it? Well, so, I mean, let's just get into some Brooklyn geography. North-south train travel in Brooklyn is notoriously terrible. So I had to get from where I am, which is about, it's if you kind of just drive a straight line into Brooklyn and Bushwick, that's where I am. And I had to get down near Coney Island. And I didn't, like, I hate, sometimes you have to go back into Manhattan, transfer, and then go, like, way deep. And, it, you know, it, so, but there is a way you can take the L to the A to the Brooklyn shuttle to the Q, um, and uh, and I did it in the shuttle. It's like it just drives through um, the park. I think it drives through Prospect Park, and um, yeah, I mean, there's there's horror stupid. stories about people getting on the the wrong train into Brooklyn, and then you have to come back into Manhattan in order to get on the correct yeah. train. It's ugly. It's yeah. ugly. Time is time means nothing. It's a huge. I think they um they said recently that if it was its own city, it would be like one of the ten largest cities. Is that it, right? Yeah, it's 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 enormous. Yeah, it's 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 pretty vast. So um, can you imagine running for mayor of New York, where you have to go to all of these places and know things about it, and you know people will come up to you and like, I knew your father, and he used to come here, and there was a plumbing store like oh, on, on 3007th Street, and, 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 and he was a good man, you know, and just you have to deal with that all the time. And you have to know every little nook and like every little nickname. I know, but now I miss all those people because they've all died. Like the old school New Yorkers. Yeah. When I first when I first moved to New York in ninety seven, there was a lot of those guys around, you know, the old school New Yorkers. And now, I mean, you can barely find one. Yeah, everyone's an artisan pencil maker now. Yeah, and, and I mean that generation is, has has died. They have just passed away. Mm -hmm. They're gone. They are not. You can look, but you will not find them. Mm -hmm. Would you say that um, they were real? The original uh, punk. Of the the New York system. Well, I mean, they they were certainly. I mean, that Segway gener failed. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that they were that they were punk because I think that they they were really uh, entrenched in in the. I'm not even sure who we're talking about exactly. Yeah, I'm not. The, but the culture, just the culture, like the the street culture, the you know, and and knowing what to do and when to do it. We were talking earlier about how you know you don't want to get on the subway during rush hour. No. You know, every New Yorker's thing is to do stuff when nobody else is doing it. Yeah. That's the trick to living in New York and and um and I guess that that is kind of a a, a punk rock ideal to do to do there something different than everybody else. So the decline of of western civilization uh Penelope Spiris was married to the publisher of Slash magazine. Uh, is that the magazine they feature in it? Yeah. Okay. So that's that that has a that's a big tell about how this movie was made and the inspiration behind it and how they were able to get all these people together. Uh, There's a cool amount of artifice that this movie kind of owns. Like, yeah. Tell us about that part. Yeah. So right at the beginning, you have um, shots from each of the people who eventually be performing, and they have these concerts, which. I've heard from other sources were essentially, I don't want to say staged exactly, but they were booked for yeah. the movie. No, they were yeah. staged. Well, they were, they, I mean, right? They they, they they booked them. I don't think they like. And they tell you in the at the end of the movie, like you know the you know this band's fear all of the fear sequences. A band, there's a band fear, called Fear. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, were were filmed at Cherrywood Studios. Right. Um, but what's what they have in this movie, which happens on every set if there's a live thing happening, but you don't put it in the movie normally, right. is all of these, uh, these, you know, just really intense punk people are reading the um, uh, the 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 video release for the movie, which is just this great um, little like bit of irony because they're reading like legalese to a, a bunch of. Uh, rowdy, obnoxious, disagreeable, yeah. Yeah. Chil children, and basically. they and they of course Teenagers. like 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 you know drop the fuck bomb a bunch while reading this like legal document and and are are making fun of it like your faces, your ugly faces yeah. may appear. So yeah, it's kind of starting uh, with you being aware of the filmmaking being aware of the the posturing in a certain way sure the attitude and you start and, the, and you think of, and you and you hear her voice also throughout it and so yeah. you're kind of thinking about who's making this movie right 
Well, I, all right. So I'm going to give a little bit of context about punk because I, I think it's interesting that you're you're 26. Yeah. And 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 you know little, very little and there's, about there's plenty about of, punk. and there's plenty of 26 year olds who know, who know Tana Tons that just never really had like a faith and didn't get to know the history. Right. And and this movie is specifically about L.A. punk and and hard, the hardcore scene, which really is very different extremely different from the New York scene that began it all or the the DC the, is a hardcore the, scene. Right. And that came along the same time that this was stuff was happening in LA. You had groups like bad brains in, mm -hmm. in DC. Uh, so personally for my, you know, my experience with punk was I, when I was a freshman in high school, I went to an alternative high school called open high in Richmond, Virginia. And I went to the library. It was a sc this school was, you know, over a coin shop down downtown Richmond, Virginia, right across the street from the public What's library. A coin shop. You know, they sell like like rare coins and huh. collectible coins. Huh. And, and and so the school was set up so that there was only 140 kids in the school and m hardly any of the classes. In fact, I think at that point in, in 77, I don't think there were any of the classes that took place in the school. And all you had to do was show up for for show up at the school every day and just check your name off that you showed up at school. And of course, you know, some people just check off the whole week and then go to their classes you know, whatever. And you didn't get graded. You got, uh, you got, uh, what did it, I can't remember what they call it, but they would, they would write a review of your performance. So you didn't even get a grade at the end of the semester. You either got full credit or if you didn't perform, you got cut credit, which mean, which meant that you were going to have to take more classes to fill in those credits. But anyway, I so said, I go into the library, um, at the, at, at this tiny little school and somebody had put on the record player that was there talking head 77 and you know songs like psycho killer and pulled up just amazing sound that record really holds up very well and you know that was like for me that was a uh, you know it was like being thrown in a pool of really cold water because it was so different from anything that i'd ever heard and then people are listening to the sex pistols um and that was such a shock because no i mean just they really redefined what rock and roll was and there's so much, if you listen to the Sex Pistols or you listen to the Talking Heads, their music is so different from what's in this movie. Yeah, I was going to say, it was like, I don't know punk that well, but, you know, I, I definitely like uh, know what the Sex Pistols sounds like. And in some of these bands, their, their country roots came through real hard. Well, and also they're for the most part they're they're untrained musicians or trained musicians who are purposefully rejecting all training, uh, and so from a, from a musical point of view, I mean, for me, you know, seeing bands like Black Flag or Fear, uh, you know, there's bands like TSOL that that are not in the movie that that became good musicians. But if you look at a band like Fear, they never became good musicians. I mean, they're they're really hard to listen to, and but the the band X really stands apart in this film. That's the one I was pointing to that that seemed to have like a like extremely oh, sure. talented guitarist. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Billy Zim is an, is is still an amazing amazing guitar player, and yeah. I, so X, when you watch this movie. Uh, X really pops from the screen, and you were talking about a few minutes ago, you know who, you know who went on to to success, and and John Doe, uh, you know I heard him interviewed Terry Gross interviewing him on NPR, you know a few months ago. Um, he's still around, and and uh, and X is still doing shows. So I think that you know they were probably the most successful band out of this uh, out of this group, and they were they were well, doing they were doing soundtracks. Um, they did. They did a lot of stuff. I know. I know the the, the lead singer of a Black Flag. Did he die or is he replaced? But he he I replaced him with Henry Rollins. Henry Rollins yeah. Rollins. yeah. I don't know what happened to the original singer that's in this film. Right. But it's a great document of that era in these bands because, I mean, if she, if Penelope Spears hadn't hadn't had this idea to to film these shows, which a lot of these bands uh, like uh, the Germs, we were talking about Darby Crash, the singer uh -huh. for, the, for the Germs, they had made such a horrible reputation for themselves that they couldn't book a gig. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I think a lot of these bands were, were informed by, I, I mean, it really goes back to Iggy Pop, I think, uh, who of course doesn't want anything to do with any 
labels at all. He has that Tom Petty thing where, like, I don't want to be a member of anybody's club. I don't want any any labels. But there's also, isn't there? Don't you think there's but, like, but Iggy Pop is is, is clearly the, the the godfather of all this stuff. There is some of these guys who also were channeling a Jim Morrison, if not, um, you know, in terms of their musicality. But the pissing well, they, on the well, audience. Funny, kind well, it's of funny thing. that you say that because Ray Manzarek, the uh, or Man, Manzarek, um, the keyboard player for um, which one for the Doors, mm-hmm. he produced X's first album. Really? Yeah, and was a big part of X's uh, success. So I, a, a lot of this, and like um, fear comes to mind. It seems like what you know. Yeah, they're not great musicians. Um, you said it. I, I don't want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Saying, yeah, but yeah. um, what what they're doing is, I mean, I was totally riveted, you know, from every like just the way that they're engaging so hostily in this very performative and like ingenious way, where everyone's coming to the show knows like, oh, those guys from Fear the Fucking Dicks, they're gonna call you, they they're gonna call you a homo, and they're gonna try to piss you off, and it's like you know that that's what they're doing, but they're actually pissing you off, and you're like getting off on this, and it's it's this that's the performance, and that's what you're there is to like rile up this this uh to like release this like violent energy and um you know maybe a little later we'll get get into this when we kind of talk no, more I, about No I I love that you're bringing that up because th- if you ever have a chance to to listen to Iggy's uh uh Metallic K- KO it's the last ever um Stooges show in Detroit uh and he harangues the audience mm. Throughout the whole thing, and and people are throwing bottles at him, and and he's yelling shit back like, "You can throw all the bottles you want. I'm making fifteen hundred dollars, and you're paying five, and I'm going home with your girlfriend." I mean, <laughs> just and and also no, another record that has the um, same kind of kind of attack on the audience is uh, the Johnny Thunders uh, record live. I think it's live at the. Sp- Speakeasy. I, let me look it up real quick. But anyway, there's a, a Johnny Thunders record where he just verbally harangues the audience for the whole time. And so, so these guys are, are have obviously obviously listened to those records and they're copping that approach. So is that is that a whole thing? And I think this I can extend this to a question about punk. Is it catharsis in a way to just release this stuff? Absolutely. Or, yeah, it seems like that. But it also does I think bring out. Um, bad impulses in people like it's it's it, nothing is just one thing you know like you see visually they don't really talk about it but the sphere zooms in on in a critical way on swastikas out there and uh there's discussions about violence against women there's yeah there's this uh there's this scene where, there, where the security guy is like no the line between violence and uh, dancing, it's kind of hard to tell. You know, you might see a guy, and he's with the girl, and then he pushes her up against the wall, and he starts fucking choking her, like jabbing <laughs> her in the tits, like grabbing her ass, and, you know, and then just dancing and having a good time. <laughs> right, right, yeah, the balancers yeah. discussing how, how, how to approach the audience. and Yeah, it's and, like, if that's dancing, then what's fighting, you know? What's violence against women in this world? And I think Spheris is kind of... I, I think she is doing... Um, some I don't well it, it almost comes off like a zoological documentary at times like when she's at like the party with X and then you hear her being why are you on the floor oh, what to, what are you to, doing on the floor to Exine to Exine yeah yeah John Joe's wife former wife yeah why do you like that tattoo why did I, you get that well, tattoo but I love I love I loved Exine's answer she's like yeah because the cameraman took the chair yeah <laughs> yeah no it's like those little things like it's such a brilliant documentary it's very it's very self-aware of the way that it's affecting what it's it's filming and, and it keeps those things in and well and it, and also by because she has the link to, to slash magazine was which was a major fanzine you know it was the really the voice of of, of this movement in la and she, because she it, it has such access to to uh, the British guy, I can't remember his name, who's got this great attitude about fuck everybody, and I and he 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 wants people to hate the, him. The, the French guy, the French guy, the French yeah. guy. Yeah. So I he's not. So you call him the French guy. So he's not like a figure, right? Like he's he's well, he's an editor of the of the fanzine, and he has his own band. So you get his that band is you get that whole link right. between the how the scene connects, and I think that's that's what she really. Uh, captures is is the scene mm-hmm. yeah it's a very it's it's not a very um 
uh, affectionate scene. It seems very critical of both uh, people's selves and of everyone else. Like the guy's whole thing, he's like, he's like, I just want people to hate me, and I hate people, and I want to express that because I think some people should fucking die because they're the worst, you know. And it's yeah. like, yeah, it's like, wow. Well, it's- well, and then and you also get the whole thing with people spitting on each other. And I don't know where that I don't think that started at CBGBs. I don't think that started in the New York scene. I think that started in 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 the the the, the London scene. Well, I just want to bring up. Do uh, you think that's like a Sex Pistols thing, or would that be the London scene? Yeah. It's also, yeah. I mean, it's also, I mean, going the other way, it's like, I brought him up earlier, but like Morrison would like piss on people. And I think there was that sort of like, like, like very like gross bodily relationship with and, the audience. Yeah. And that's, and that's, there's lots of stories about, there's like a story about Iggy Pop, like wrapping up a turd and giving it to somebody in the audience or something. Yeah. Disgusting stuff. Um, who's the real, uh, vomiting. Who's the real, he's not in this movie. Who's the the real, uh, crazy guy that did a lot of stuff with like shit on on stage. Oh, that's uh, G.G. Allen. Yeah, G.G. Allen. Oh my god, yeah. what a f- that's the natural nightmare. That that's the natural was. progression of this, right? Is, I don't is, think that's the natural. Pro- this is a Dion- you know, it's a Dionysian uh, art form, and that and 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 that's where again I get behind that, yeah. and that and that's again where it comes from. Iggy, you know, Iggy was very intellectual about how he put his act together when he was 16 years old and going out, going, leaving his, his little trailer home in Ann Arbor and going into the ghettos of Detroit to hang out with the old blues musicians. You know, that's the story really of how Iggy put hmm. his, you know, con- conceptualized uh, what he wanted to do with his music. Uh, and so you've got these, these young LA kids that, you know, they have that, do-it-yourself attitude and i you know i like also how it, the movie shows the innocence you see darby crash is such a little baby and you just want to take see, care of him yeah and you see in the audience you know penelope spirits shows the way the audience is interacting with one another and you can see the way the girls and the boys are interacting mm-hmm. um, and you'll see like the girl like touch the guy or like flip off the guy, you know, a foot from his face. And, mm-hmm. But obviously, you know, they're it's like a it's like a dating ritual that the that these kids are doing in this context of, you know, I want to be different, you know. And the girl who says like everyone should have blue hair, which is of course totally counterintuitive because if everyone did have blue hair, it would spoil the effect. Yeah, there's there's, there's you can't help but project, I don't know if you're projecting, there's so much innocence to them because they're at the beginning of the scene and, you know, but like part of the reason I wasn't into punk is because being into punk or a punk was a absolute cliche when yeah. I, when I was in yeah. high school and, oh, yeah. it, and it, it was, was all done yeah yeah long it, gone it, there's a, there, that would be more um conformity than I like was was looking to have you know so yeah, I mean by it's the... interesting to see people in a very um or, originalistic way like be into these things and then there's stuff that they're into that didn't stick around it didn't like enter the prototype of what like a punk is and so that's that's interesting to see this like this bubbling mass out of which this weirdly very rigid format of what punk like looked like um which is all counterintuitive because it should be yeah and 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 there's so much hypocrisy in you know it's just like any little tribe where everyone wants to stand out and every i mean i remember when i when i moved from Richmond to San Diego, and I joined the Rock and Dogs. Sam and Dave, these two guys who'd gone to high school together. Is that a band or like a motorcycle? The Rock and Dogs, that was our band. And if you look at, che, there's a website called Che Underground, and you can hear our songs on there. And it's pretty That's cool. cool. Um, I was in the Shell Silversteins. Oh, really? Yeah. What she, did you play? I played drums. I played gu- guitar and keys. Nice. Oh, yeah. you were, you were. Bilingual, and I, uh, I there was a, <laughs> there is there's one song which I think has only become more relevant that I actually sang or kind of like talk song. It was a, uh, uh, I forget what it was called, but it was about how I, um, I stopped being a prostitute and I became a politician, and my mother cried. <laughs> The day I made my mother cry is the day I became a politician. Oh my god! Gotta pull that out. That's only getting riper. <laughs> so, um, is so the LA punk scene. Uh, I, I when I when I lived in San Diego, I I would see uh, um, 
some of these shows. I even produced uh, the only show that I ever produced. I actually produced a, a TSOL show where I got to take home all the cash in a little metal box. Ooh. You know, it was fun. Uh, but I I would see X like they would they would play for the blast with the blasters a lot. And so I've I've you know did I've, you have a crush on her? Xene. Xene. What do you think? Um, I I know I know. Uh, I know people who did. I didn't, but I know people who did. She's she has a whole Dolly Parton thing that they they really surprised me because um, they seemed very um, s- southern in a certain way and like almost genteel. And the other thing about this movie in general is all these people in Southern California sound like they're from the the Midwest or the South compared to what no, a lot that sounds of, like a now. lot of them are. All yeah. right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a treat. Here's the here's the rock and dogs. It's gonna sound like shit. I don't know where the speaker is. Still sounds good to me. Anyway. Cool. What are you doing on that? I'm playing the drums. Nice. Yep. Kept me busy for about four years. That's real fun and rhythmic. You know, hitting those power chords. That's what. Oh yeah. That's what being a young kid's all about is getting the power oh, chords my in God, there. So much fun. I mean, I remember have we built a, a studio in my garage when I lived in San Diego and I was living on Lorraine Street and all the fucking neighbors just hated us. Yeah. You know, because we'd hang out in the front yard and stuff in this little, you know, very white, upscaled neighborhood. And we had this this ranch-style house. I imagine you got just, like, long boards hanging around and pulled top beer cans scattered everywhere. I don't know. Maybe, that, maybe I'm that, aging you too much. But. Yeah, no, well, that wasn't – yeah, that was that was – that was our bass player Jeff who came into the band because he was a roommate and uh, yeah he was an asshole. His whole he would always say, "I'm so Cal, dude." And um, I'm interested in an I accent. Got, I, got in a, I got in a horrible fist fight with him. Because, oh yeah, yeah. He he, did, he he was such a pig. He'd walk into the in the living room where my girlfriend because my girlfriend and I were, were um, shacked up in the in the master bedroom of the place, and he'd like. Like he'd be laying in the in like spread eagle, and like Lori would come through the uh, living room, and he'd say, "Hey, Lori, is this not the hot shot?" What the fuck does that mean? He's like showing his crotch, like, "Hey, is uh, this not the hot is shot?" Is this not of, the like, hot my... shot? Oh, pig. Anyway, <laughs> wait, was he naked? I was. No, oh, no, no. Oh. He'd have like shorts on or whatever, uh, yeah. but he was just a pig. So one day, I, I just, uh, I just lit him up. I, I got you know. What happened? I, Give me the play by play. Well, there was a couple things that happened. I was, was it I, like was it like uh, uh, the the end well, the of the first, first the first thing that happened the, weapon. the first thing and and this is like the story of punk. I, I you know it was it was there was a lot of violence around it. And anyway, I got home. I was working as a hawker at Jack Murphy Stadium, mm. and um, which is no longer Jack Murphy Stadium. That's like giving out hot dogs and stuff. Yeah, but I was hawking souvenirs. Yeah, and so you know with the little mini bats and I twirl them around and stuff. And so I got would you, home, would I, you yell shit? Yeah, of course. What'd you yell? You know, get your souvenirs. Get yeah, of course. Yeah, no, you had to yell <laughs> yeah, all yeah, the yeah. time, like I just constantly, wanna... and you got to walk all over the place. It was tiring. souvenirs, tiny bags, keychains. Give me your nephew. You got it. Act like you love him. You got it. 
You got it. So I got home on a Sunday afternoon, and Jeff and my other two roommates had been drinking all day, and the, the, the kitchen was trashed. And they're hanging out in the front yard, and I go out in the front yard, and I said, hey, you know, Lori and I want to cook some dinner. Can you guys clean up the kitchen? And Jeff comes over to me, and he does the thing where you put your leg behind the other person, and you shove them on their ass. Ooh. And uh, and I and I said, oh yeah, okay, fine. That's it. That's what you want. Let's let's go inside so that there, we don't. There's no interference. Um, and as soon as we got inside, I wasn't. Oh, you're a badass. You go inside to fight. People. I went. I took him inside to fight. And, <laughs> and and this is how dirty. I've never done this move on anybody else, but for some reason, it just came to me in a moment of inspiration. And I dropped to my knees and I just punched the shit out of his stomach. And he was he was crawling into the corner of my dining room, begging me to stop, and you know like for mercy, like don't don't beat my ass anymore. And the biggest mistake that I made, Mike, I stopped. <laughs> I didn't finish the job. What's finishing the job in this situation? I guess sending him to the hospital because it just seized burst a kidney. It seized in me for the for the next week. And so finally, I come home one one day from school, and I just because they didn't want to, because they did the little the tabletop, yeah, and they wouldn't clean the kitchen. No, because he because he the hot w- shot thing. Well, there was all of that. There was all of that. Just a lot of animosity, and also I had let him in my band. I mean, I had to fight to get him in my band because Scott Harbor was the bass player, and he left. We needed a bass player. Jeff was a decent bass player, but he was into Led Zeppelin and shit. And this is like another point about punk is that punks were very particular about the, about you know the le- the musical language that you like. Like you know, it was very it was all coded about what you liked and whatever. So anyway, I come home and I had an audition. None of that Led Zeppelin shit. Oh my god, fuck no. Um, <laughs> So I, I had I had an audition at San Diego State later that night, and I, I think I was doing like a monologue for Macbeth. It was some Shakespearean monologue, and I come home and Jeff's in the backyard lifting weights, and I just I couldn't take it anymore. I was I just I just went over and just punched the shit out of him. And, Sound and the fury because Cole it, story. because I hadn't I hadn't finished the job the first time, and of course this time things didn't go so well for me. Um, I threw a a bad punch and I I threw my shoulder out of socket the first time it ever happened, and um, so Jeff ended up pulling my my sh- my t shirt over my head and giving me two enormous black eyes. And so I had to go, you know, Lori's there in the master bedroom, you know, bringing ice for me to put on my eyes. And I got an audition in two hours. So I went to the, I went to the audition. And of course I got the part because I showed up at my audition with two enormous black eyes. And I have to say, I had, I had like girls coming up to me and going, Ooh, Tomcat, you know, girls liked it. So it worked out you know, it did have its upside, but uh, Who, were you auditioning for one of the like, uh, like a uh, one of the a, main stage a, a beheaded no, uh, nobleman? No, it was, it was auditioning for the Three Musketeers, and I got cast. So you know, it did it did work out. But you know, that was the atmosphere, and of course, the, you know, there was this whole thing with like East Coast to West Coast, and you know, anyway, blah blah blah. What's um, were there what's where, where are the hippies at? I mean, they're gone by like a long shot. I realize that basically a decade. But what relationship? Because it comes up in the movie, right? Is that there is a sort of a cultural vacuum from? Well, there is a lot of animosity about about white about you know the the inception of punk you know was about wiping out the hippies and what people saw as excess. Because you'd have bands like Led Zeppelin or like the 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 most hated band of them all, the Grateful Dead, because hmm. all they did was just play these jams. I mean, you know, the average punk song, no solo, you know, there's about that. It, very it could not down, be more three, the opposite. Three minute, yeah, three minutes. And as they discussed, that the songs actually have as, uh, supposedly as many lyrics and as many verses as your standard song. They're just played at like uh, 75% or 200% of the speed. So they're. Yeah, I didn't. I don't agree with that. That guy's kind of talking out the side of his neck. Yeah. But. Um, that guy who. Is that the, that's the, is that the British journalist who's no, like on the yeah, cliff? The yuppie guy. Yeah, yeah, he's so funny and weird. And like at the end of his thing, he does. A Woody Allen shrug. It's he's, it's so, yeah. Like he's kind of the strongest character in the movie. Too. He, he's really putting on a persona. Yeah, he's. I'm just a um. I write about punking the, the L.A. scene and uh, you know it's 
these kids today, I just, you can't really wrap your mind around it, but, you know, it's, they're sort of doing regular songs just faster, you know, the average song is about, I believe I've read it's uh, 127 RPM on average, I'm just guessing, but these song, uh, I think he actually calls them heartbeats per second, like, he, I don't think he said BPM, I think he called it heartbeats per second. Well, I like, I like Iggy Pop's, um, description of how he came to his songwriting uh, ethic was that he would watch Soupy Sales. Soupy Sales had this show in the 60s, early 60s, right. mid 60s, and he would ask viewers who they're all children. The, the show was geared to kids and he'd say, you know, send in your postcard, 25 words or less. And so Iggy designed his whole songwriting style around the Soupy Sales motif of, of, of writing the songs with 25 words or, or, or less. And, and it came full circle for him because he ended up using Soupy Sales' uh, sons, uh, Tony and Hunt Sales, um, bass player and drummer, respectively, on uh, at least one, if not two, of his of his records. And they also played rhythm section for, for David Bowie on, on uh, Ten Machine. Do you think do you think Soupy was saying that to give creative artistic constraints on people to increase their uh, their their creativity and genius, or do you think maybe he, he was just like smacked. he was teaching some kind of lesson? Do you think he was like kind of smacked out of his mind and didn't want to read long ass no, stupid he was, letters? He from was children. a stoner. He wasn't a he wasn't a junkie. He was a, he was a stoner. Yeah, he always had a big old bag of pot gone. So. I still like. Uh, I l- really like that ta- you're talking about the comparing it to something like the Grateful Dead. This, this, um, it's kind well, not of not comparing it. That's the contrasting is what contrasting is is what I mean. That's the antithesis. It's the, it's the antithesis. Um, what else do you think? Um, th- I mean, the thing about punk is it's it's complaining about um, a lot of the societal problems, but. It is also really focused. It's kind of like hip hop in a certain way, where it's like it's a lot of like infighting too. You know, like you have people that are talking about broader concepts, but it kind of seems like um, the the majority of the content is calling out people who are full of shit and like don't really belong in the scene and like aren't aren't good enough. And it's a lot of like uh, you know the way like rappers are calling out each other. Um, do you do you do you buy that connection between um, the sort of uh, like ethos of hip hop and, and punk as like kind of social commentary, but kind of just like, hey, here's what cool fuck you, you're not cool, I'm a fucking well, girl. Well, you know, there's a lot of racism and sexism going on, uh, and also and also homophobia, but 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 veiled homophobia. The lead singer for it's also for, for fear, you know, he's calling people in the audience faggots and stuff, and but you know. Conversely, it's so the, homoerotic. The, 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 yeah, the exactly. He's very homoerotic, and and totally. the, and he's bragging about being from Frisco, and of course that was a that was a taboo. If you lived in San, I lived in San Francisco for about twelve years, and uh, you were never supposed to call it Frisco. It was San Francisco. Yeah, even I know that. So what's yeah? What's he doing talking about being from Frisco? So what is the codedness from that? I think I, I well, and he's is I, he just he's like to... he's like a, he, he, I think what you know the game that he's playing at there is kind of being a self hating. Uh, homosexual is he is, is he is he known that is that he's gay or i don't is know he that, playing I'm, with just, that I'm, I'm i'm just calling my information from what i got out of the, his performance the performance it's it is so um it's it's a really geniusly executed um it's, i mean it's, i think it's performance art where you're you're eliciting a reaction and what this movie gets like really brilliantly is you see the most intense um reaction and violence to the fear set before they've played a single note. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Sorry. A, little, a little more rock and dogs. We have some rock and dogs at the end of this, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's, um, it's interesting that the, it's, it's not exactly about the music. It's not, not about the music. I think it's about the reaction. And on one extreme, you have the, the band fear is almost unfair to be in this movie. Cause they are so, uh, sort of um odd like these like genius like um savants at what they're doing to get these people pissed off at the other end i want to say is darby crash who i love to talk about as this yeah, like tragic talk about puppy the, dog talk about of the, the movie about the germs and darby crash i i thought it was interesting what, what, what darby said about how uh about his performance how he had to get really fucked up in order to go on stage and be brave enough Will to somebody do somebody give me a beer <laughs> can i have a beer there's like 
uh, like they they do a super cut of him asking for Bila. Yeah. Yeah, I'm. You know, so th- there's. You know, there is self destruction, but this is. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> this is. You know, this is Reagan. This is Reagan era. This is when. This is when th- the shit was really hitting the fan, and and people, kids were pissed off about you know, the stuff that was going on. So do you? I mean, there's a lot of political uh, subtext to everything because they're. They're reacting to it. And it's also, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but what I was a little shocked at when I saw the movie is how is how white it is. Yeah. The culture is really white. I liked... One of my favorite things about this movie are the little interview sequences that she does with the musicians where she gets them off alone and there's the one guy who shaved a, an x on his head and she are they she musicians or just it. in the scene I yeah think they're just in the they're scene. scene some of them are musicians or are, are, are they all just in the scene the people I, that she did maybe i think those they're kind are, of normies yeah maybe those people are just are just in the there's scene. a light bulb behind them it's like it looks like the shots from dragnet where they're like caught at the end like bum, 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 bum. like yeah. it's like uh and it, 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 everything kind of goes black and white during those it is they are sequences. yeah no those those are uh monochromatic and um but you know he she's interviewing the latino kid and he's talking about you know you can't even say the n-word anymore but you know he's using it freely mm-hmm. and uh you so you, you you get that sense of, of racial conflict there's um tension the kid who's interviewed the most has a totally shaped head he looks like he's like 15 oh yeah tops. such a baby he's a little baby yeah. and um you know he's he's in what's uh seems like a really it seems like a dark scary scene like honestly you know if you look at the way these kids live you see the way that black flag lives and first of all that apartment it kind of seems awesome like it's just kind of, it's oh, the, yeah, where, the, the they ultimate have, they have college a, a, apartment a closet they have a cl- like yeah what the kids like, are, they, they've they got live in, in the closet. they live literally in closets in an 16 dollars a month rent in an, in an abandoned church it's kind of like you couldn't write like if you wrote that you'd be like all right all right a punk band living in the basement of an yeah, abandoned church this is church the epitome the... of starving for your art yeah these these kids are totally committed and that's another thing that Iggy was very into there's a there's a uh, i think it's a clip where he's on dinosaur dinosaur is interviewing him he kindly put on a a blazer over his topless chest uh but you know and and he talks about how uh or no this is the Tom Snyder interview sorry uh where he talks about how you know this he legitimizes punk by saying you know these are young men who put their whole soul into what they do they're you know he really may, makes like a cogent stand for the musicians and what it takes to to do it you know, it takes a lot of you know it took a lot of work and effort these, these kids were really putting their whole selves into this movement it's cool what, what do you think about the relationship between um punk and like skinhead ism and neo-nazi ism which is alluded to even in this movie which surprised me i right. uh i kind of assumed that that came along at a later date but it seems like there were you know, no, there's a lot, there's a lot of a lot of that stuff that that comes up, and, and I almost feel like it would have been more innocent at that time. You know, we live, you know, this is you know hashtag Trump's America now, and like this shit yeah. is coming back with a oh, vengeance. Yeah. No, you see it, you and clearly see it. You you clearly see it. Like in this last week, there have been it seems like dozens of swastikas sprayed across the country and and violence against people, and so there, and I, I feel like I feel like there's something more sinister about the emergence of it than in 1981 in in Reagan, uh, or it's like seventy nine or eighty one. It's very early. This it, movie, I think, is is, is eighty. I can. It's eighty. Wrong. Okay, so it's it would have been. Um, is, is Reagan just coming in, or is it as is he already was he sworn in in eighty or eighty one? I forget how the elections work. Uh, but um, he, this is. I mean, this is Reagan era. I feel like there's something more. Um, less. What I'm trying to say, it's less sinister to be showing those symbols, possibly. But this is a very white crowd. There's a lot of just uh, people finding things to create like anger and hatred. So you know maybe that uh, the same seed that we see in um, in uh, neo Nazism now has the you know it go- runs just as deep and em- allowed itself to emerge in the punk community. And what do you think it is about? 
punk that like lets that exist. Well, I, I think Penelope Spears was a genius for naming the film "The Decline of Western Civilization." I mean, because you hear that and it catches your ear, and you you know, you want to see this movie, and so I think she was very prescient in 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 catching catching wind of that. And, How and, serious and phrasing you, it? You know, it's. <laughs> I feel like five years ago, I would have said she's uh, being like uh, ironic. She's like, I would assume, like, I named it after the title. It was a headline in the, the LA Times covering the punk scene. And like, I, I thought it was over the top because these kids are just having a good time. But, you know, if you want to, if you want to draw a line between like the modern alt right or something and, and punk well, rock. Well, the, the, this, this movie made an impact. Uh, she filmed it in 79 and 80. And it was released in eighty one. So it's and actually the, pre. It's pre Reagan, actually, like just barely. Yeah, just barely. And in eighty one, the LA, the then LAPD chief of police, Daryl Gates, wrote a letter demanding that the film not be shown again in LA after it was shown. Oh the yeah, first I've heard time. that. Yeah, the, this movie was banned for a long time. You couldn't see it for the for for uh, at least publicly in LA for decades. Is that right? I didn't I, know I, it was banned. I well, I mean, isn't that isn't what he said? I I'd heard this. It was it was very difficult to see for a long time, which I think added to its clout. And um, so to get back to who who emerged from this and became famous and who kind of like uh, petered all right, out. So, all right, so let's just cover the bands real quick. We'll, yeah. we'll just name them off. There's, 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 there's only a few. So, um, the Alice Bag Band, which are kind of awesome. I really like that band. They only have two songs. I think uh, Catholic Discipline is the French guy's band. Mm -hmm. he, their band only has two songs, but the Alice Bag band I, I found really interesting, and I liked, the, I liked the musicianship, and I liked the lead singer a lot. She has, has a lot of charisma. Much more charisma I think than the... Um, is she the one in the dress? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was fascinating. Yeah, yeah, really not, cool. It's not what you think it, about as punk. Like, yeah, the, it, the scene is forming, and so it's like not everything sounds like... She's Asian, and she can really sing, yeah. and the band is tight. Uh, so you've got Alice Bag Band, you've got Black Flag, Circle Jerks, who I found pretty charismatic, uh, even though I never really listened to Circle Jerks, Catholic Discipline, Fear, Germs, and X. Mm -hmm. And X has five yeah. songs, and, and it's for, for my money... X just blows they, all, they were all, all the completely other the away. best musicians. Yeah. yeah. Um, how punk are they? Well, I you mean, judge for yourself. You know, you got Billy Zoom playing that badass rockabilly guitar with his legs rock, spread, yeah. and and just a smile on his face. And he and whenever you saw that band live, that's exactly how they were. You, there's so much. There's so much cool resonance between the the musicians dj bone break the drummer is not wearing a shirt and he's a great great drummer and then exine was i mean she is a true poet there's no question mm -hmm. about it. it's very you know you know it when you hear it and john doe uh playing bass and singing great harmonies between john doe and exine uh so yeah I, Who, who's their guitarist again are you, are you his, his name is billy zoom billy zoom are you worried like me that he, he's going to be played in a biopic by miles teller Absolutely, no question. <laughs> I like the I like the scene where where they ask him uh, how old he was when he started playing guitar, and he says six, and he, and then he says, and before that I played accordion and piano and something else, and and he's he's kind of falling asleep with his guitar while he's while he's moving his fingers just on the fretboard, and you can I, there's no question Billy Zoom is a consummate consummate musician, yeah, consummate guitar player. Yeah, you feel like if he was in another scene, he he could have you know he, he could have done anything he, he wanted. Could have been do. in Mozart's court. He could have uh, you know been. Um, oh yeah, in, in the Rolling yeah, Stones sure. or something. Just yep. wherever he was, he yep. was just gonna kill it. Absolutely, because he's he like they talk about how sexy he is, and I think part of his sexiness is because I think he's really fucking punk because he is just gonna be him. You know, right there. Well, the you know you got John Doe using the the cheap. Uh, Tattoo. He's making. He's giving cheap the tattoos. Stick and poke. What's it? Yeah. He, stick and poke. Yeah. yeah. And and Penelope Spears asks Billy Zoom if he's going to get a tattoo, and he says he doesn't want a tattoo. And she asks him why, and he says, "I think it's just too trendy. I just don't want it." Yeah. Yeah. He's like he's he's normcore is what we'd call him now. Is like he. He doesn't really dress in any aesthetic besides what like kind of seems comfortable. Well, but, I don't agree with that. I think he's pretty stylish. Yeah, I mean, but he's not falling to that scene. You know, he's completely doing well, he's his a own rocker. thing. 
Yeah, he is. He's a hardcore he rocker. Does, I mean, he, he sticks And out. he can wiggle his ears, which is like independently and simultaneously. Is he dating Exene? They seem like No, he, John Doe and, and Exene were, were husband and wife mm, during, during that period. They mm. lived together. Well, Exene seemed to, she was really praising how, how hot he was. I like, yeah. and I really like that about, about, X, you know, John Doe's probably 19 at the time, and they're asking, you know, she's asking him uh, about uh, one of the songs, and he's saying, you know, it's it's about, you know, imagining if you could have sex uh, once every hour for 24 hours, and if I could have sex once every, you know, I'd love to have, have sex once every hour for yeah. 24 hours. I mean, that, and that he says that, and that's, that, you find know. Find me, yeah, find me, a, like he, I'm not saying every 19-year-old would think to say that, but I think they would all agree with it. Exactly, you know? exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say it's just to go with that. This try to say something intelligent about punk. Do you think it's kind of it's it's saying the thing that every person wants to say, everything that they're feeling. It's it's not like art that is saying something complex and like revealing a, a like higher truth. It's like it's a like it's a it's a primal truth that people don't want to say and express, and it's almost like you 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 carve it to be as sort of um i don't say dumb but as simple as possible you know yeah i don't agree with that i think you're trying to pigeonhole it i don't think it, you know it, and and that's that's part of the, the the punk attitude is doing something different and making it as great as it can be for what for the tools that you have available mm -hmm. and obviously you know x is the cream of the crop because they've got a real poet and they've got a, a trained, a highly trained guitarist and drummer, and uh, and John does no slouch in the in the bass department. I, I know you just criticized me for saying what's not punk um, by trying to define punk, but is there a one through line does seem to be that it's almost about identifying what's not punk. You know, that's true. It's that's true. It's kind that's of true. This... And I remember having having conversations with with my bandmates about you know because I was really into Warren Zevon, and they're like, oh no, not Warren Zevon. He's not. He's not punk. He's you not know, punk. which and, and and so you know, I had to take my 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 hits for that, but I I still love Warren Zevon, and I think he's you know punk as fuck. So that's Ow. how it is. <laughs> All right, on that note, I guess it's time for one more Rockin' Dogs. This Somebody somewhere um, attributed to me, that, like, like this was, uh, this was the, the song that really showed off my, my drumming um, to, the, uh, to the best extent, and I, I won't argue. 